sign. Yep. I hear myself. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm sure there'll be a couple more people trickling in, and I know we have a lot of people online listening in, so thanks for tuning in. Uh, I am Dr. Arthur, and we have a special guest with us today. We have Dr. Michael Wexler. He came all the way from National Jewish, where he serves as the director of <clears throat> the Cohen Family Asthma Institute. He also works as a professor of medicine there, seeing patients. He has a wealth of knowledge that he's going to share with us today regarding asthma. He spends a lot of research time in there. He's certainly got the history to back it up. Um, just want to share a couple notable things in his history. Um, he has served as the PI for the AIR-2 trial that helped pave the way for FDA approval for bronchothermoplasty. He has several awards. Um, awarded by the NIH for his work with placebo controls and asthma clinical trials and actually has a manuscript to set the standard for how we design trials in asthma. He's a member of the steering committee for the ACRN, the Asthma Clinical Research Network. He <clears throat> has one of the largest cohorts of eGPA patients, does a lot of research with IL-5 with these patients and several journals, major journals, that he has sat in historically or currently. He's editor for CHEST, European Journal of Clinical Investigation, the associate editor for Journal of Allergy, and he has over 185 peer-reviewed manuscripts, probably in counting, uh, in a lot of notable established journals. So let's give a warm welcome. We have Dr. Michael Wexler. Thank you so much. Good morning. It's great to be here. Uh, it's nice to be in Hotlanta. And uh, it's such a pleasure. Beautiful, growing city. And uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about asthma, which I think is a big problem in Atlanta, actually, in and of itself. I think it's a major hub of asthma. And when you look demographically across the United States, uh, New York, Atlanta, and Los Angeles are three major, major hotspots. And we've made a lot of advances in asthma over the last several uh, decades. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. We're going to talk about how we think about asthma differently. And um, what I hope you'll take away from this talk is the notion that we can really have a huge impact on our patients with asthma, particularly patients with severe asthma. And uh, we've done a good job. You know, there are over 25 million people in the United States with asthma right now. And uh, we've been able to cut down the number of emergency room visits by about 10%, from 2 million down to around 1.8 million uh, over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And the number of hospitalizations has also gone down from about 500,000 to about 350,000. So we've had a huge, huge impact. And I think we're setting the stage for actually even having greater impacts. And we're now talking about concepts like remission in asthma. And that's the biggest buzzword that is going to be discussed at the American Thoracic Society meeting, which starts this week. And uh, at the allergy meetings, we're all talking about remission in asthma. So, um, so that's what we're going to focus on today. Uh, these are some of my financial disclosures. They've been mitigated by Piedmont. My other major disclosure is that I'm a huge New England sports fan, uh, so I apologize for the 28 to three comeback a couple of years ago. Sorry about that uh, against the Falcons, but uh, now I'm getting it back to me. I think the, the Patriots stink now, so it is what it is. Uh, but uh, I've always been a big Atlanta sports fan. I like the all the big big Braves pitchers, Greg Maddox and Tom Glavin, and uh, even like guys like Mike Stanton. All those guys in, in the past, obviously. So great to be in Atlanta for a great sports town. And uh, this uh, has been reviewed by uh, your uh, CME folks and whatnot. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, asthma treatment approaches. I'll talk about the history of asthma, uh, and then we'll talk about some of the shortcomings of current asthma therapies, and then we'll talk about how we want to offer a precision-based approach for patients with asthma. Uh, and uh, to do that, we're going to talk a little bit about endotypes. You should be asking for every patient you see with asthma, what type of asthma does this patient have? And that's what we're going to talk about. But 
just a little bit of a history. Asthma has changed a lot in the last several centuries. And we used to use, you know, there were a lot of things that have been tried in the last 500 years from just, you know, diet and exercise and sleep. That's tried and true, works for just about everything, uh, to fetid gums and then ether was used. And then uh, people started using, in Osler's time, uh, morphine and chloroform and amyl nitrate. In fact, there were asthma cigarettes that were utilized several hundred years ago with belladonna and stramonium. And those actually, people were being prescribed cigarettes for their asthma, incredibly so. Now, we've evolved this past century in the last hundred years. We've seen evolution from utilizing epinephrine to oral steroids to theophylline, which I don't know if any of you utilize theophylline, but when I was training 30 years ago, patient would come into the emergency room, they'd get put on an aminophilline drip, and then they'd get hospitalized with theophylline and aminophilline, because that's all we had. It was an era before the beta agonists were quite prevalent and utilized. Chromalin was utilized. And then in the last 30 years or so, we've started to utilize anticholinergic therapies, ipotropium to teotropium in 2015, and then in the 1990s, we started to utilize long-acting bronchodilators, long-acting beta agonists, and inhaled corticosteroids. And there wasn't a lot of movement uh, after, you know, in the, from the 1990s. These are just, you know, from theophylline, chromalin to inhaled corticosteroids. The leukotriene modifiers came out in 1996, 1998 or so with uh, Zafri Lucas, Xyluton, and Monte Lucas. And that was sort of the first step of offering patients an alternative to inhaled corticosteroids and bronchodilators. So the leukotriene modifiers came out in the late 1990s. And then in 2003, we saw this evolution in asthma management where we started to utilize biologic therapies. And we started to utilize uh, anti-IgE or omalizumab for the management of patients with allergic asthma. And that he had a huge impact. And then in 2011, there was approval of uh, bronchial thermoplasty. Any of you know what bronchial thermoplasty is? It's a procedure where we go into the airways with a bronchoscope. The bronchoscope has a catheter that has got a basket uh, at the end of it. And the other end of it's heated up to, is hooked up to a heat source. And that heat source heats up the airways when you go into all the different segments of the airway up to 65 degrees Celsius and burns the airway smooth muscle uh, that underlies the mucosa, also has an effect on the airway wall nerves. And that procedure, which was approved by the FDA about 13 years ago, uh, really is quite effective. It reduced exacerbations and hospitalizations by over 50% and had a sustained effect. It wasn't taken up too much. And uh, this, the company that makes the catheter uh, is no longer going to make it as of next year. So that's sort of come and gone. But the asthma therapies that we've seen have had a huge evolution. And you know, there's all these different kinds of inhalers, meter dose inhalers, dry powder inhalers. People use spacers and all sorts of different devices. But we've moved a little bit beyond the inhalers. Everyone gets still inhalers but we're tweaking inhalers, we're having more precision-based therapy, and we're offering a variety of new strategies. And that's where we are today. We've moved from an era of <laughs> bronchoconstriction-based treatment, where we just gave bronchodilators, to the 1990s, we started targeting inflammation and giving inhaled corticosteroids. And then in the early 2000s, we started to recognize that asthma patients are different, that your asthma is different from your asthma is different from your asthma. And we started to recognize these different phenotypes and clusters of patients. But it's really been in the last decade or so, 10, 15 years, that we've started to utilize the term endotype, where we identify patients based on their mechanism of disease. We start to say, well, not only do you have a specific phenotype, like you're allergic, but you might have a specific mechanism of disease. Your asthma might be IL-5 mediated. Your asthma might be uh, IL-33 mediated. 
your asthma might be IL-6 mediated and neutrophilic. Um, and we start to recognize that these their patients have these different patterns that you can recognize biologically by utilizing specific biomarkers. So we've started to, in the last couple of years, really treat patients based on their specific endotype. Now, I utilize the term endotype, and you know a lot of people get confused between the terms phenotype and endotype. So the phenotype is the outward manifestations of an underlying disease process. It's something that a patient can describe to you because they can see it. That's the phenotype. It's the outward manifestation. And it can be something like you're tall, you're short, you're fat, you're thin, you're black, you're white, you're male, you're female, you're old, you're young. It can also be you're allergic. It can also be you've got uh, aspirin-sensitive asthma. Because a patient can tell you what some of those stimuli are. The endotype refers to the underlying mechanism of disease. The endotype refers to the specific patterns and mechanisms of a given individual's disease. And these different phenotypes and endotypes can respond very differently to different therapies. We used to just give inhaled corticosteroids as a one-size-fits-all for everyone, but now we recognize that we want to have a more targeted, precision-based approach. And that's why we endotype. We endotype so that we can personalize therapy, so that we can maximize drug response. We don't need to go through a variety of different steps to get the right drug to the right patient at the right time if we can choose up front the biomarkers that will predict better response to different therapies. This holds true for asthma, but it holds true for a variety of different diseases. Cancers, more specifically, we're starting to target patients now based on specific mutations that will predict response. So in asthma, how do we endotype? How do we offer patients precision-based therapy based on the mechanism of disease? And the answer is biomarkers. And we've got a variety of different biomarkers that we utilize in our patients with asthma. We can give them, we can evaluate their eosinophils and their sputum. We can look at their blood eosinophils. We can look at exhaled nitric oxide, which is an important biomarker that predicts IL-13 mediated activity. We can look at IgE levels, which tells us that someone's got an allergic pattern to some extent. It doesn't always predict responsiveness to the different uh, to the different uh, biologic therapies. We can also do allergen skin testing as well, which gives us, the, uh, gives us information about what could be causing patients' asthma. But we need more biomarkers, and there have been several biomarkers that have been evaluated, including periostin, which is a biomarker of IL-13 activity, DPP-4, a dipeptidyl peptidase 4, eosinophil peroxidase, eosinophil cationic protein, urinary bromotyrosine. These are all things that are being evaluated. IL-6 levels, correlates of that CRP levels. We're looking as well at genetic profiles of patients to evaluate whether we can utilize pharmacogenomics in patients with severe asthma. Now, <coughs> all of these biomarkers have the potential to give us a more personalized approach. But you have to have an understanding of what the underlying biology is to appreciate all the different mechanisms of disease and where do all these biomarkers fit in. So I'll show you a, what I like to call a confusogram. This is an asthma confusogram. Uh, it's basically a bunch of confusing arrows going in different directions that highlight all the different mechanisms of disease. When we talk about asthma, we're really talking about two broad types of asthma. We're talking about type 2 asthma on the left, and then non-type 2 asthma on the right-hand side of the slide. But if you break these things down, then it, this confusogram has become a little bit less confusing. So I think about different stimuli that irritate the airway, so allergens and different antigens, irritants, pollutants, uh, viruses, bacteria, fungi, microbes, all of those interact at the airway epithelial layer, and they can all stimulate release of 
different mediators and cytokines. The airway epithelium serves as a protective barrier, but it also produces cytokines. It produces, in particular, these epithelial cytokines are called alarmins. And let me see if this pointer works. Oh, yeah, uh, maybe not up there. But uh, there are three major alarmins: TSLP or thymic stromolymphopoietin, interleukin 25, and interleukin 33. And TSLP, which you can see on the left-hand part of the slide, stimulates Th2 cells and ILC2 cells, or innate lymphoid cells. And that's why it's called type 2 inflammation. It used to be called Th2 inflammation. But Th2 cells and ILC2 cells produce interleukin-4, interleukin-5, and interleukin-13. Interleukin-4 is on the furthest part of the left-hand slide. That stimulates B cells to make IgE. IgE binds to mast cells and basophils, and in the presence of different allergens, causes mast cells to degranulate and release mediators like histamines and leukotrienes. And that's part of the allergic component of asthma, IL-4 mediated. Interleukin-5 stimulates eosinophils and is involved in the maturation, proliferation, and activation of eosinophils, which release its own mediators like eosinophilic cationic protein, major basic protein, eosinophil-derived neurotoxin, eosinophil peroxidase. IL-13 goes down to the smooth muscle layer and acts in terms of airway hyperresponsiveness, and also goes up to the epithelium and causes mucus production and production of nitric oxide. So that explains type 2 inflammation, and we can evaluate type 2 inflammation by looking at eosinophils, by looking at nitric oxide, by looking at IgE levels. On the right-hand side is non-type 2 inflammation, which is usually brought forth by different microbes and pollutants and bacteria and whatnot. And that causes more neutrophilic inflammation and is involved with IL-6, IL-17, IL-8, TNF-alpha, interferon gamma, amongst others. So the reason it's important to understand this confusogram is so that you can understand what type of asthma a patient has, what's the dominant pathway in a given individual. And that will inform how we're going to treat our patients with severe asthma. So we have new asthma guidelines. In fact, the newest set of guidelines just came out last week. You can look them up at gina.org or globalinitiativeforasthma.org. And they advocate for a stepwise approach for the management of patients with asthma, um, which include starting off with, on the bottom part of the slide here, is what's advocated in the United States, which is patients who have intermittent asthma should take a short-acting beta agonist, like albuterol. But one of the nuances is, is that now it's recommended that people take an inhaled corticosteroid whenever they take albuterol. So no patient should be on albuterol alone, because if they have symptoms, they likely have inflammation. And if they have got inflammation, then you should treat them with inhaled corticosteroids in addition to the bronchodilators. You want to treat both components of an acute asthma symptoms, which is inflammation and bronchoconstriction. In fact, there was a newly approved therapy earlier this year that has a short-acting beta agonist, albuterol, with an inhaled corticosteroid, budesonide. And so that's an, one option, or you can just take them as separate entities. But it's no longer, no longer recommended that people take albuterol alone because then you're ignoring the underlying inflammation. Beyond that, you go up from a strategy of intermittent inhaled steroids with beta agonists to take low doses of inhaled corticosteroids on a daily basis. And then if patients remain poorly controlled, you can add on a long-acting beta agonist. And then if patients remain poorly controlled, you can escalate the dose of the inhaled corticosteroid, keep on the long-acting beta agonist, and then consider adding on a long-acting anti-muscarinic agent like theotropium. It's in those patients who are at step five where you really have to be cautious and you really want to consider referring your patients for management of their severe asthma. It's those patients that you really want to phenotype and evaluate what type of asthma they have. And you also want to uh, evaluate other factors that could be contributing to their asthma. 
When I see a patient with severe asthma, I do a five-step approach. First question is, is it really asthma? Because there are other things beyond asthma that cause asthma symptoms. Do they have vocal cord dysfunction? Do they have uh, heart disease that causes some of the wheezing? Do they have a foreign body? So that's the first question is, do they have asthma? Second of all, if they're already at step five, are they adherent to their therapies? Are they taking their therapies as recommended? Or maybe they're not taking their inhalers. They're expensive, they lost it, they can't find it, they're just humans, and they're just not taking their medications as prescribed. The third question is, do they have other things that could be complicating asthma? Like, do they have vocal cord dysfunction? Do they have reflux disease? Do they have sinus disease? Do they aspirate? Those are some of the complicating factors. And at National Jewish, we do a whole workup where patients will get a, uh, you know, an esophagram, a tailored barium swallow. They'll see speech therapy. They'll see ENT. They'll get CAT scans of the chest and sinuses. Then the fourth step is, is I endotype my patients. And I'll evaluate what type of asthma they have. Do they have eosinophilic asthma, allergic asthma, IL-13 media asthma? Do they have non-type 2 asthma? And then, as a last step, I will then consider a biologic therapy. But only after I've done the rest of that workup will I consider the biologics that we have. And we now have six biologic therapies. Anti-IG therapy with uh, omalizumab, um, we have uh, anti-IL-5 therapy with mepolizumab, reslizumab, and benralizumab. We've got anti-IL-4 therapy with dupilumab. And then, more recently, we had anti-TSLP therapy with tezipelumab. But there's a lot of other therapies that are in development. We're working very hard to offer more strategies for the management of our patients with asthma. Anti-IL-33, Anti-IL-17, Anti-IL-6, Anti-M1 prime, many other therapies. We're using antibiotics for patients with severe asthma because there's a large cohort of patients who have mycoplasma or chlamydia or MAC, and mycobacterium avium, in their airways. All of these are strategies that we're offering our patients. But first we have to understand what type of asthma these patients have. Now we have all these biologics, and they're very effective. What can we achieve with these biologics? Well, we can reduce exacerbations, and we've been successful. As I mentioned, we've gone down from 2 million emergency room visits to about 1.7, 1.8 million emergency room visits. We can reduce corticosteroid dose. There used to be a lot of patients who were dependent on oral corticosteroids. They would take steroids every day, they would gain weight, they would uh, uh, have all the complications of corticosteroids, cataracts, glaucoma, osteoporosis, all of those different things were quite prevalent. Now we see very few patients who have oral corticosteroid-dependent asthma. And these biologics have been effective in terms of facilitating corticosteroid withdrawal. The biologics have improved symptoms. They've improved quality of life of patients. And in a subset of patients, one of our goals is to induce remission, and about 30 to 40% of patients can actually achieve remission. Our another goal is to achieve disease modification, which is a step before cure. It's sustained remission over time. So how do we go about choosing which, bio, which therapy is best for your patient? And the way I approach it is, uh, is first of all, I want to offer a precision-based approach. I want to evaluate biomarkers. I want to understand what type of asthma these patients have. I want to phenotype the patients. I want to see if there's other comorbidities that could be going along with their asthma. Do they have atopic dermatitis? Do they have chronic rhinosinusitis and nasal polyps? Do they have eosinophilic esophagitis? My goal is to offer these patients a personalized, precision-based approach. And I do that by measuring the biomarkers as well as looking at specific phenotypes. One of the pathways, and what I'll do is I'll go through each of these different biologic therapies. Anti-IG was approved 21 years ago. It's mostly for allergic asthma. 
it reduces exacerbations. That's with omalizumab. In the last eight years, though, we've had approval of the other five biologic therapies. And the biggest innovation, I would say, early on was the development of strategies that block eosinophils, that target interleukin-5. This was a major, major advance. In 2015, 2016, and 2017, we had approval of mepolizumab, reslizumab, and benrolizumab. Mepolizumab and reslizumab bind interleukin-5, and benrolizumab binds the IL-5 receptor. And these monoclonal antibodies, these targeted approaches, what they do is, is they prevent eosinophil activation, proliferation, maturation. And there's a, more than 70% of patients with severe asthma who have eosinophils playing a role. Eosinophils get into the tissue and cause release of all these different, you look at, you look at the eosinophils, see these granular proteins there? Eosinophil cationic protein, major basic protein, eosinophil derived neurotoxin, all those cause eosinophilic inflammation and can play an important role in causing asthma symptoms. So if you can block IL-5, you'll block eosinophilic proliferation. If you block the IL-5 receptor, you'll prevent IL-5 from binding, and you can also have killing of eosinophils through antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxic effects. So how have these drugs done in terms of their efficacy? Well, 10 years ago, we saw these articles in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was actually May of 2014. And there was a couple of articles, one by Hector Ortega, one by Elizabeth Bell, that showed by giving anti-IL-5 therapy, you could have a significant impact on asthma exacerbations. And you could reduce asthma exacerbations by 50% in patients who had eosinophilic asthma. And it was a modest effect on lung function, FEV1. On the right-hand side, Elizabeth Bell's study, those were patients who had oral corticosteroid-dependent asthma. And on the top part, you can see that it facilitated reduction of corticosteroid dosing by about 50%, while still reducing exacerbations by 50%. So it reduced oral steroid dose and reduced uh, corticosteroid, uh, it reduced exacerbations. Reslizumab was the second biologic therapy approved in 2016, and it was effective in terms of reducing exacerbations by about 58%. On top of that, it had a robust effect in terms of improving lung function. And this is a therapy, it's, it's, got, it's sort of gone a little bit by the wayside because it's administered intravenously, but it is dose based on body weight and can have benefits in more heavier patients in particular, or patients who may have higher eosinophil burden. Benrolizumab in patients who had high eosinophils, also in these two studies, the Sirocco and Kalima studies by Bleeker and the late Mark Fitzgerald showed that you could reduce exacerbations in patients with eosinophilic asthma. And one of the nice things about this drug is that after the first three doses, which are given monthly, it can be taken every other month. So you could take a biologic therapy every eight weeks. It's easier on the patients, it improves adherence, and also reduces costs over the long term. So benrolizumab was another effective therapy, and it too showed efficacy in terms of being, having an oral corticosteroid sparing effect. In this article by Param Nair, it showed that in the placebo group, you could reduce steroid dose by 25%, but with benrolizumab, you could reduce corticosteroid dose by 75%. And while these patients reduced their corticosteroids, they were also able to reduce their rate of exacerbations by as much as 70%. So that is a huge impact, reducing corticosteroids, reducing exacerbations, and benrolizumab has been uh, shown to be an effective therapy. In 2018, we had approval of dupilumab, which blocks the IL-4 receptor alpha. And IL-4 receptor binds both IL-4 and IL-13, which I showed you in that confusogram, play an important role because IL-4 is involved in B-cell activity and production of IgE, and IL-13 is involved in airway hyperresponsiveness, mucus production, <clears throat> as well as nitric oxide production. So this, 
therapy, dupilumab, was approved in 2018 for asthma. It's also been approved for atopic dermatitis in 2017, as well as chronic sinusitis, nasal polyps, as well as purigo nodularis uh, and, uh, and uh, other entities as well. So dupilumab, in this study that was published 10 years ago now, there was a significant reduction in exacerbations, 87% reduction in exacerbations in patients who had uh, type 2 asthma with more than 300 eosinophils. And in, what they did in this study was they actually tapered people off of inhaled corticosteroids and tapered people off of beta agonists. And despite the fact that people were off their inhalers, the dupilumab group did quite well in terms of preventing exacerbations. So these people were on no inhalers by the end of the study, and they did significantly better with an 87% reduction in exacerbations. This was followed up by a larger phase three study. And it can be, dupilumab can be administered to two different dosing strategies, either 200 milligrams or 300 milligrams every two weeks. And it was innovative because this was the first biologic that could be given for at-home administration. So patients didn't need to come into the office. And this therapy was shown, you can see on the forest plot on the right-hand side, patients who got, had higher eosinophils or higher nitric oxide did quite well with dupilumab. And this was the largest study of asthma at the time with over 1,900 patients who were enrolled. Um, it also showed a significant improvement in lung function, over 300 milliliter improvement compared to baseline, over 200 uh, milliliter improvement or 150 milliliter improvement compared to placebo. And this study was, this drug was shown to be effective over the long term, out to 96 weeks. It was shown to have a sustained improvement in lung function, sustained reduction in exacerbations. And by the way, all of the biologics have been shown to have a sustained effect. Benralizumab, mepolizumab, dupilumab have all been shown to be effective. This was also shown to be effective in children. It was one of the first biologics to be effect, shown to be effective in children. Again, patients who had type 2 inflammation with high eosinophils or high nitric oxide, they, they, they were, uh, this therapy was shown to be effective. But now we're in 2024. So these therapies were approved in 2015, 16, 17, 18. Now we're in 2024. And now we have another biologic therapy that was approved just a couple of years ago, tezipelumab. Tezipelumab binds TSLP. Remember when I showed you the confusogram at the top? There are those epithelial alarmins like TSLP, thymic stromolymphopoietin. So tezipelumab works at the top of the inflammatory cascade and prevents Th2 and ILC2 production of IL-4, 5, and 13. So this landmark study by Jonathan Corrin uh, a couple of years ago showed that when you give tezipelumab, you can have a robust effect. These are three different doses of tezipelumab in terms of reducing exacerbations by 61 to 71%. But what was most remarkable was that this therapy seemed to be effective independent of biomarkers. Patients with high eosinophils, low eosinophils. Patients who had high nitric oxide and low nitric oxide. And patients who had an alert, high allergic or Th2 status and low allergic Th2 status. Each of these groups, it seemed to be effective. And this was borne out uh, in the phase three navigator study where in the overall population, there was a 56% reduction in exacerbations. These are patients who were poorly controlled on an inhaled corticosteroid, a long activated agonist. There were people who were at that step five of the asthma algorithm that I showed you before. And we were able to reduce exacerbations by 56%. In patients, what was most remarkable is that patients with low eosinophils, this is the first therapy to show a substantive reduction in exacerbations in patients with low eosinophils. There's an over 40% reduction in exacerbations in people who had 300 eosinophils or less, and also 150 eosinophils. And in fact, whether patients had high eosinophils or low eosinophils, more than 150, less than 150, uh, whatever their baseline was, whichever threshold it was above 450, 300 to 450, 150 to 300, less than 150, this therapy was shown to be effective. But also in terms of nitric oxide, 
high nitric oxide, low nitric oxide. Nitric oxide above 50, 25 to 50, less than 25. By the way, if you're not checking nitric oxide in your patients, you're missing something. You're not being informed about the type of asthma they have. It would be for every patient, again, I want to know what type of asthma they have, so I check eosinophils, I check nitric oxide, I check, I check IgE, because those are the three biomarkers that we have available to us today. If you don't check all three of those, it would be like doing a cath and only looking at the left coronary without looking at the right coronary or the, you know, the LAD or whatnot. So you want to get a full picture of what's going on. And that's what these biomarkers offer. Similarly, by the way, uh, allergic status. And this therapy was effective in patients with high and low uh, 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 allergic status. This therapy, tezipelumab, also was effective in terms of mitigating all of these different biomarkers. It lowered blood eosinophil count compared to placebo. It lowered nitric oxide levels compared to placebo. It lowered IgE levels compared to placebo. It's the only biologic that can do all those. The anti-L5s lower blood eosinophils quite well, but not the others. Dupilumab, anti-L4 lowers nitric oxide, lowers IgE, but doesn't lower eosinophils. And anti-IG doesn't really have a beneficial effect in terms of lowering total Ig counts. This was shown not only in the blood, but also uh, on a bronchoscopy study called the Cascade Study, where patients had bronchoscopies done before and after treatment with tezipelumab. And what was demonstrated was that in the submucosal tissue, tezipelumab lowered tissue eosinophils quite substantively without a dramatic effect on neutrophils, T cells, mast cells, uh, or other, uh, any of the other cellular elements. So this showed that it lowers eosinophils in the tissue without potentially inhibiting uh, other inflammatory milieus. This therapy was also shown to be effective also over the long term, similar to dupilumab, mepolizumab, benalizumab. Up to two years, you still see sustained efficacy, and I presented these data at the European Restory Society about a year and a half ago. So we have all these biologic therapies. Here's a sum of them. Dupilumab, omelizumab, benalizumab, mepolizumab, reslizumab, tezipelumab. The first step is learning how to pronounce them. That's the first step. Once you've figured out how to pronounce them, then you want to uh, understand what the mechanism is. Dupilumab works in IL-4, is, is an IL-4, IL-13. Omelizumab is IgE, benralizumab, mepolizumab, reslizumab, block IL-5 or the receptor, and then tezipelumab binds TSLP. Then down to what indication? And I should, benralizumab was just moved down to age six in the last month, so I should change that. But uh, they're for the most part down to age uh, six. Tezipelumab is still 12 and up. Reslizumab is still 18 and up. In terms of frequency, Dupilumab is every two weeks. Omelizumab is every two to four weeks. Uh, Benralizumab is every four and then every eight weeks. And the rest are given on a monthly basis. There are other approved indications that you need to be aware of. So if patients got atopic dermatitis, you might consider dupilumab uh, as well. Dupilumab also um, is approved for chronic rhinosinusitis, nasal polyps, as well as eosinophilic esophagitis, as well as pergonodularis. And there was a recent study showing it's effective in eosinophilic COPD as well. That'll be another talk that we'll have to have. Um, omelizumab is effective in chronic spontaneous urticaria, as well as nasal polyps. And mepolizumab has indications with eGPA, eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis, as well as uh, for the hyper-eosinophilic syndrome. eGPA is a syndrome that's characterized by asthma, eosinophilia, pulmonary infiltrates, sinus disease, neuropathy, vasculitis in one or more end organ, as well as antineutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies. So these therapies are effective, all, and they're approved all over the world, all of these therapies. And they achieve great outcomes. They reduce exacerbations from 25% up to about 70%. They can improve lung function. They can improve oral corticosteroid reduction. They can improve quality of life, variably. All these things variably. Again, there's no 
major head-to-head -head trials of any of these therapies. But people ask, well, you're getting 50% reduction. What about the other 50%? And is the glass half empty or half full? So I view it quite positively. I think we're in a great place right now. I think that despite the fact that exacerbations are only reduced by 50% and steroid dosing is only reduced by 50% and that most patients fail to achieve lung function, we are able to achieve asthma remission in a large group of patients. Remission is now the buzzword. It's defined as having no significant asthma symptoms. It's, uh, it's no significant asthma exacerbations, normalization or stabilization of lung function, and plus or minus normalization and stabilization of biomarkers, IgE, eosinophils, and nitric oxide. And when we look at the biologics over the last few years, there's been quite an amount of work looking to see, can we induce remission? And most therapies have been able to reduce some degree of remission, uh, but only up to about 38% can achieve remission. And maybe that's because we need better biomarkers, we need more biomarkers, we need more therapies, we need alternative uh, therapies. So the bottom line is, is that we need to still do more. We've achieved so much, but we still need to do more. So there are other therapies that have been in development. One therapy was an oral therapy called favipiprint, which is a CRTH2 antagonist. It's a prostaglandin D2 inhibitor. It actually looked pretty good initially, but it failed to improve lung function in one study, um, and it, it, people are still evaluating its, their role. JAK inhibitors, which are used for rheumatoid arthritis and other indications, are downstream of a lot of related cytokines. They're being now studied in phase two. We're part of a network called PRECISE, Precision Interventions in Severe Exacerbating Asthma. And we're giving a variety of different therapies. Another strategy is itapecumab, anti-IL-33. This was shown a couple years ago to reduce exacerbations versus placebo. This was a study I published in the New England Journal of Medicine, shown to be comparable to dupilumab, but for some reason less effective in combination with dupilumab. Uh, here's the results from the New England Journal of Medicine from a couple of years ago. Dupilumab and itapecumab in orange reduced exacerbations. Interestingly, the combination to uh, didn't uh, reduce exacerbations as well as either one alone, but all did better than placebo. Another antile 33 therapy binds the ST2 receptor, which is the receptor for IL-33. Here, too, there is some efficacy in term with astigolumab, particularly patients with eosinophilic asthma, reducing exacerbations by 40, 42%. IL-25 is another strategy. It's another epithelial cytokine that in most models has been shown to be effective in terms of reducing IL-5, IL-13, and IL-17 levels. There is now a long-acting anti-IL-5 that's in development, depamocumab. It's given every six months. Going to, the phase three data, the study is over. I'm going to find out the results in the next three to four weeks. We're going to find out whether giving a biologic every six months, twice a year, can have efficacy in patients with eosinophilic asthma. Dexpramipexol is an oral therapy. It was developed for ALS. It arrests eosinophil development. It reduces eosinophils. It improves lung function. This is also in phase three right now. For non-type two asthma, we have azithromycin. So what do you do with patients who have got no eosinophils, no nitric oxide, don't have allergies? I give those patients azithromycin. 500 milligrams, three times a week seems to work quite well, reduces exacerbations by up to 40%. Bronchial thermoplasty I still do in a subset of patients. Tezipelumab, that seems to work well in some patients with non-type 2 asthma as well, and is still being evaluated. Can we identify other novel therapies that can better abrogate some of this non-type 2 asthma, neutrophilic asthma? Can we give JAK inhibitors? Can we give anti-IL-6? These are some of the strategies. Should we be targeting the airway microbiome? 
there's still a lot of areas that remain still challenging. You know, response to all these asthma therapies is quite variable. We need to understand who responds to what therapies. We have all these multiple biologic therapies, and we've got patients that we can treat with, you know, anti 5, anti 4, anti TSLP. But how do we decide which therapy is best for which patient? There are no head to head studies. So, my general strategy is for all these patients, I do an extensive workup. I endotype my patients. I check biomarkers. I check IgE, nitric oxide, eosinophil count. In the future, maybe we'll have more. And then I look for what the dominant biomarker is, or I look at do they have multiple biomarkers that are elevated. And then you can look at the different types of asthma. So patients who've got allergic and eosinophilic asthma, you won't go wrong if you use any of these biologic therapies. Anti-IG, anti-L5, anti-L4, anti-TSLP, all of them should work. Patients who've got allergic non-eosinophilic asthma, well, if they're non-eosinophilic, then the anti-L5s won't work, but anti-IG, anti-L4, and anti-TSLP should work. If they're eosinophilic and they're non-allergic, well, if they're not allergic, you're not going to give them anti-IgE. But if they're eosinophilic, you could give them anti-L5, anti-TSLP, anti-L413. Or if they don't respond to anti-IG, or if they're out of range for dosing of anti-IG treatment. But then you need to look at other factors, other comorbidities. You need to also evaluate um, you know, what the patient's insurance is. How often do they feel comfortable taking a shot? Do they want to take it at home or in the office? People are busy. A lot of people with asthma are younger, so they don't have time to come into the office every two weeks or every four weeks. And so for them, it might be okay to just give them at-home administration. We don't have any major head-to-head -head studies. But the major questions you should be asking when you see patients with severe asthma, one, is the patient poorly controlled. Two, is the patient adherent to therapy? Work on adherence. Look at pharmacy records. Three, have you addressed their comorbidities? If they still have chronic sinusitis, if they still have eosinophilic um, uh, or atopic dermatitis, if they still are aspirating, if they still have significant reflux disease, no biologics are going to work. So you have to address all the comorbidities. And then, if, is the patient on systemic corticosteroids? Because that's a major problem for a lot of patients as well. So I check biomarkers. I look for the dominant biomarker. I look for type 2 comorbidities. And then I give a biologic. And if it doesn't work, I consider switching. In some instances, I might consider adding a biologic. Well, I don't do that much anymore. But my goal is to try to offer a precision-based approach to all my patients. We're no longer in an era where we have a one-size-fits-all approach. We want to identify what type of group patients, what type of asthma does the patient have, put patients in specific groups. Ideally, we want a more personalized approach where I can give drug A to patient A, drug B to patient B, drug C to patient C, uh, and so on. We're not quite there yet, but we're in more of the stratified medicine approach, and we're getting there. So we have all these great options. And I'm excited that we have all these options. They offer a lot of benefits for our patients. We need just to remember all the different mechanisms that are at play for our patients with asthma so we can give the right drug to the right patient at the right time. So thank you so much. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, and I think I'm even on time, which is incredible. Um, and uh, so thank you so much for having me. And uh, yeah. Thank you for coming. Yeah. I have sort of a question that I might offer a partial answer to my own question. My question to you as a bona fide asthma specialist is in an era of medicine that uh, maybe at an unprecedented rate is developing a bevy of therapies in the monoclonal antibody space and, for example, in cancer immunotherapy in the 
targeted genetic mutation space. These therapies are coming on board rapid fire. Studies are being done all over the world at an unprecedented rate. And the mechanisms, I think, for these therapies, particularly when you get into the complex immune response of airway epithelium and all the downstream cascade, and the same could be said for tumor genetics and biology. What is your advice as a, as a true uber specialist in this space for pulmonary critical care physicians, you know, uh, pulmonary critical care providers who uh, are not necessarily having our finger on the pulse of, you know, every new study that comes out and certainly do not know the whole inflammatory cascade about you know, is it's dizzying to me as a practicing pulmonologist in the office. I'll see a couple of new patients with asthma today, and there's no way I can remember all of that. How do we do that? And then maybe a call to arms to the experts in this space to over time develop workable guidelines that busy clinicians can utilize to at least kind of get us further down the road to, th to that ultimate goal of precision tailored therapy for patients with asthma. Yeah, uh, it's such an important question as all these new therapies are emerging uh, in asthma and in other specialties. Um, the, 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 the amount of information, the amount of drugs that are coming out are just exploding all over the world for all sorts of different entities. And so we need to partner with, uh, with specialists and it's okay to use the phone a friend option. I mean, you know, I, I get calls all the time from, you know, friends. Oh, I've got a rash. I've got this. I have no idea what the rash is. It's like, yeah, it's a rash. Uh, you know, you need to talk to your dermatologist to figure out what kind of rash it is. And, but even within pulmonary, you know, there's all sorts of drugs for pulmonary hypertension, interstitial lung disease, uh, lung cancer. I don't know the best option for each patient, but in those cases, we want to do what's best for our patient. So to do best for your patient, it's okay to have a little bit of, uh, um, you know, uh, let's, I'll, I'll, let's call a friend. And, and even when I see patients, I saw someone this past week with hyper eosinophilia. I'm an eosinophilia expert. And I called up Amy Cleon from the NIH. I was like, this is a little bit of a different kind of patient. What would you do here? One of the things that I think we have to recognize in medicine is how little we know. I mean, first of all, how little like all of us know in general, but then how little we know about all these mechanisms of diseases. You know, 20 years ago, I was the same practicing asthmatologist, but I'd never heard of TSLP or ILC2 cells. So I've worked to sort of understand that specific niche. It's okay to phone a friend and ask for help. And uh, and as you utilize these therapies more, as you say, okay, you know, uh, my friend, the allergist, what would you recommend? Oh, I recommend uh, benralizumab or tezipelumab or whatever. Uh, then you feel a bit more comfortable understanding the nuances of when to use each one. But I think it's impossible to keep track of all the different therapies that are emerging. But you should know that they exist so that you can refer when appropriate to those specific specialists. Because the asthmatologists and the allergists, they should know what the, these drugs are and all the confusograms and nuances. Yeah, you know, I think uh, the allergists are pretty good at appreciating all the different nuances. And then, uh, um, you know, my, my email is up there, by the way. So if you have a, you can always email me or call me uh, and I'm happy to answer those questions. But yeah, I, I think in the same way, you know, National Jewish is a very specialized place. So we have specialists in asthma, COPD, interstitial lung disease, cystic fibrosis. I mean, there's all these cystic fibrosis drugs out there as well. So, you know, like, I, I don't know uh, which ones to use in which patients. Yeah. Could you discuss briefly the role? Use the microphone. Yeah. Could you discuss briefly the role of allergen-specific desensitization therapy for people who are polysensitized at this time? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so allergy shots, or uh, 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 I think, still play an important role 
in the management of patients with allergic asthma. Uh, they are complementary to the biologic therapies. It's been shown that if you uh, give either allergy shots or more recently sublingual immunotherapy to patients, it improves outcomes uh, and gets people sensitized to specific allergens. Uh, it's in patients with allergic asthma, been shown to reduce exacerbations and improve outcomes. So there's still a role for that. I think, how do you decide between allergy shots and immunotherapy versus some of the biologics? That has not been a, there's not been a head-to-head -head study, but maybe there needs to be. Although I think allergists might be afraid to do that because it's a big part of their bread and butter. Thanks, Ashley. Give me a mic. Did it work? Michael, thank you for an excellent talk. And I think uh, you, you did a wonderful job, as expected, giving us uh, an overview of the basic sciences, et cetera, around a lot of the therapeutic things that are happening. As you pointed out, a lot of, of novel things is happening when it comes to therapeutics, et cetera. But you kind of alluded to this at the very beginning of your talk when you referenced uh, uh, Los Angeles, New York, and Atlanta, in that one of the things we're coming to understand that it's not always necessarily your genetic code that determines your mortality risk, but sometimes your zip code has a bigger impact. So what are some of the things that are happening, specifically National Jewish, Denver, and even in the asthma world to address some of the structural and social determinants of health that impact asthma disparities? Such an important question. You know, we, we've done a lot of work as part of the Asthma Clinical Research Network. I led a few studies um, looking at uh, asthma in blacks, for instance, in African-American population. Um, and um, uh, we found uh, in our studies, first of all, a lot of minorities are underrepresented in all these clinical trials. So, uh, and I've got a poster at the American Thoracic Society looking specifically at response to the biologic therapies in minority subpopulations because for many reasons, uh, they're not included in, in many or they're underrepresented in clinical trials. So I've done work looking at asthma, particularly in the African-American population as well as in the uh, uh, Latino population as well. We've done large studies now. We found that, uh, as you alluded to, despite the fact that there is access to therapy in a lot of these patient populations, there is still increased risk of exacerbations, increased risk of uh, hospitalizations, morbidity, and worse lung function. And that's when we give drugs to these patients for free in the clinical trials. What does that tell you? Well, first of all, there are a lot of other environmental causes. And in the same way that if we don't take care of uh, you know, the comorbidities, the reflux, uh, the sinus disease, we're not going to take care of the asthma. In that same way, if we don't take care of the environmental allergies that occur in a lot of these settings, and uh, a lot of minority populations are living in substandard quality of uh, quality living uh, locales where there might be uh, cockroaches, which are significant allergens, uh, rodents, which are significant allergens, uh, we're not going to have a major impact. So we need to do a lot of things. And you talked about uh, some of the structural racism components that exist. We need to work with institutions and government bodies to work on better housing, better education, and other resources to offer patients the best opportunity to uh, improve their outcomes. We've done these zip code studies, and we've seen that in, there are certain zip codes that are disproportionately affected with asthma. And it's usually because of socioeconomic factors and other factors. We need to do a lot more work. We evaluate to see whether there were biologic differences, genetic differences. We, in, in those large black studies that we did, we did not find those. So that tells me that while there are, there might potentially be biologic differences, we couldn't identify them. It points more to environmental factors 
and institutional factors that are causing these issues. So it's a major, major issue. It's something that I've worked on for the last decade, and I think we need to do a lot more to improve outcomes in those patient populations. Yes? Can't hear you at all. It was my turn. I was next, but here. When you mentioned the environmental factors, I presume that includes the zip codes that have been clearly demonstrated, some asthma populations associated with poor air quality yeah. areas in the marginalized communities as well. Absolutely. Yeah, so air quality, so this gets to so many issues. Um, and as we've seen, uh, climate change issues uh, that's been shown to be associated as well with worse asthma outcomes. And uh, air quality, poor air quality, smog, uh, it, those all have a major, major impact. And as we've seen climate change become more and more of an issue, we've seen a rise in prevalence of asthma as well. So, you know, I'm so happy we have all these different therapies, but we need to address so many other issues. We need to address disparities in the community. We need to address climate change. We need to address a variety of issues in order to actually truly have an impact on a large portion of patients with asthma. Because the therapies, which I mentioned, they're great, but they're band-aids, basically, for a lot of other issues that we need to address. Mm -hmm. Just a comment from uh, Dr. Patterson. He was asking, like, what should our docs do? What, like, do we have a guideline? I just want to say, what should we do as Palm when the other specialists they send everybody to us, like the allergists, ENT, they come to us. What do? What should we do? What should What should we do in terms of? When it comes to prescribing the biologics, maybe not for the severe asthma, yeah, the so, nasal polyps and others. Yeah, so, well, you, you did the first step. You know, we were learning more about severe asthma. You're here now. You were seeing what all the options are. And so then it's up to, uh, I think, you to, and, and all of us to learn more, to work and partner with people with expertise. The allergists are usually very, very up to date with all of these specific therapies. And then as you work with them, you gain more comfort in terms of thinking about prescribing them. But, you know, it's like when you first got into, you, you, when you finished medical school and you started being a doctor and you're an intern, you don't know anything until you do start doing things. And once you start doing things, you get to be a really good intern and then you get to be a really good resident. And then over time, as you learn more and more, you develop better practice habits and learn more and more. But you've got to keep on learning. And that's one of the things that I've learned in medicine over time is that it's an ongoing process. Can't hear you at all. Sorry. Uh, for the 30% of patients that we potentially put into asthma remission with the biologics, are there guidelines on maybe um, stepping down maintenance inhaler therapy, or what do you do in your practice? Yeah, actually, the new 2024 guidelines actually talk about a study that came out in November called the Shamal study, um, which was a study in which patients who were well-controlled in benralizumab, who were on inhaled steroids and long-acting bronchodilators, were randomized to continue those other controllers or uh, taper them down. And actually, they did quite well um, for the most part. There was, in the people who stayed on them, there was a 4% rate of exacerbations. In the people who came off of the inhalers, there was about an 8% rate of exacerbations. So they did quite well with low exacerbation rates. Um, but there was a subset of patients who had a reduction in lung function as dem and that was correlated with nitric oxide in those patients. For me, a study that I'm planning is actually tapering the biologics. And what I do clinically, I think the biologics are much more expensive. So to me, it makes much more sense to taper the biologics. The pharmaceutical companies are not interested in tapering biologics because they cost $40,000 a year. But what I do clinically is, is I gradually increase the interval in an off-label manner in between dosing. Um, and, and so drugs that are every four weeks, I'll slowly go to every five weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks. 
they can tolerate being off for 12 weeks, then I say, well, why don't we stop, stop it for like four or five months and see how you do. Some patients do okay, and some patients don't. So we're planning a study where we actually demonstrate that degree of efficacy and that that's a bona fide strategy. It isn't for everybody, but probably about half of patients who are on biologics can probably come off of them at some point if they're well controlled for over a year. If you start someone on a biologic, do you recommend that they have an EpiPen available for adverse reactions? The only biologic uh, in which there's a recommendation for an EpiPen is omalizumab. And oh, that's because uh, in a very small proportion of patients, there were some anaphylactoid reactions. Uh, that hasn't been shown with other biologic therapies, so I don't usually routinely give it unless they have some other reason to have an EpiPen. Uh, we want to be respectful of everyone's time. We were put through 9 o'clock, so if anybody needs to go, uh, feel free. We thank you very much. If you guys have questions, you can kind of filter up here if you have anything else. We do have a question from a rem remote attendee. Um, any luck getting biologics approved for other eosinophilic diseases such as chronic eosinophilic pneumonia to reduce steroid dependency? Um, yeah, I, most of those patients with chronic eosinophilic pneumonia have concomitant asthma. And so I will just say that they've got eosinophilic asthma with pulmonary infiltrates with exacerbations, and those patients will get approval, and then I'll taper their corticosteroids. Or I say that they meet the criteria for eGPA because if they've got asthma, eosinophilia, pulmonary infiltrates, and sinus disease, which a lot of these patients have, then that uh, is part of the definition of eGPA. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.